right, all right, all right. Welcome everybody, our watchers at home here in Portland, Oregon, and all around the world on our watch side. Welcome back to another episode of Open Playground here at Open Signal. My name is Kat Miel Garcia. I'm your host tonight, and I'm so, so, so excited and happy and enthusiastically consenting to our wonderful guest, Miss Jamie, here with Sex Positive Organization. Welcome, Jamie. Thank Thanks. you for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to talk about what we do. Yeah, I mean, that's a great segue. I would love to hear more about Sex Positive and what you do at this organization. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Now, a lot of people hear this sex positive world, and it's almost like it's scary because of what our culture has told us about sex and sexuality. Sure. What we actually do is we are an education-based uh, nonprofit. So we help people build communities around consent and boundaries. We do that through teaching classes that literally take you through like basic sex education, like how do you have a safer sex talk with somebody? Um, and practicing things like how do you actually say no? Like if you've ever been in a situation where you wanted to say no, but you said yes anyway for safety reasons or because you don't want to be rude or you were like, this guy's really cute, so I don't want to, uh, I just, I'll just say yes because I don't want to lose the opportunity. So we help people actually build the skills to live a more consenting lifestyle, which I find very empowering on a personal level and very healing also. That's excellent to hear. And I definitely think that a lot of our members of our audience are going to resonate with that feeling of not knowing like how to say no and not come across rude, but maintain those boundaries for your own safety and for real intimacy, right? And I'm curious, um, does Sex Positive, do they do outreach and education for youth and adults or just one sector of our society or all? Right now, we um, we do all of our classes online, oh, okay. so technically anybody could attend them. They are age appropriate. Um, we generally want people to be 18 or older. If they're under 18, we want their parents to be present just because this can be such a volatile subject mm -hmm. just on the face of it, regardless of the fact that it is appropriate. So we mostly focus on adults. In particular, we get a lot of parents because they say, I never got a good sex education. How am I going to teach my kid because they're growing up and I don't want to repeat that pattern of feeling that kind of shame or not knowing what I want or being taken advantage of, whatever that background is. Mm. So um, say I'm interested in um, coming to one of these classes, how would I find out more information about, you know, when they are and how to yeah, for involved. sure. Um, we have a website. Okay. I'd say that's the okay. easiest way to find us at sexpositiveworld.org. Okay. Um, on our events tab, you can find on the main page or sexpositiveworld.org slash events. We tend to do those core classes come up like once a month, usually every second Sunday. We have chapters all over the United States and also internationally. Oh, wow. So we're on the Pacific Coast, so our classes tend to start at 10 a.m. because that's... Uh, 7 p.m. in Belgium and it's you know the middle of the day if you're on the east coast so that lets us actually serve all of our communities wow. I mean we're still missing some and something I'm actively working on right now is actually videoing all of those classes so that we can make them available as online learnings I mean that's part of why I'm here at Open Signal because I wanted to get access to all that equipment that's what my background's in because like people are so desperate and really, really want this kind of training and to be able to internalize it and watch it a couple times and try it out. Plus people really are interested in starting their own groups. Mm -hmm. Like after the pandemic, I think people really wanted to find a way to connect better. Mm. And a lot of us only have connection through like religious communities and not all of us are Christians, not all of us are in a religious community. So this lets people actually have the tools to create those themselves. Nice. So basically like setting their own value system in place, setting their own boundaries that would work for them in their lifestyle choice. Exactly. Cool. Exactly. That's excellent. So what do you find is the, the like maybe top three questions that you get from folks who are attending your um, classes and programming? Um, well, I, one of my favorite classes that we teach, we have four of them. One is an intro to sex positivity. We call it orientation. Okay. Um, we also have awesome boundaries around the world, which fo focuses on culture and how we basically like we bring in all of these lessons and we don't even realize we're doing it. Um, we have one that's on called sexy intersections, which is about how our identities affect how we move about in like the dating scene and our gender identity, the ways that you might face different problems than I do based on your identities. Mm -hmm. And then we also have one called the pleasure talk, which is our safer sex talk. Um, my favorite of the four is the awesome boundaries class because I am a people pleaser. Mm -hmm. I love pleasing people. I like making people happy. And sometimes that is a superpower and sometimes that's really 
awful and really cost me a lot. So um, I'd say a lot of it comes to things like no is a complete sentence. And people ask a lot of like, wait, but what about this? I feel like I have to tell but a story. Why? But why? I can't. Yeah. Like, like that's a really big one. I think that people come to um, other questions come to things around like, how do I teach this to my kids? How do I take this? How do we get this in the hands of young people? Because they're the ones who really, really need it. Sure. So I think those are some of the number one questions that come up. And then like for the pleasure talk, it's like, what do you even include if you want to be intimate with somebody? And my idea of intimacy might be completely different than yours. So it's like, how do I ask those questions? And a lot of us get really locked up and we're like, I don't know, just, just let things happen or I'll just pursue and just see if it works out. Mm. And it makes things really awkward. And it means that we're not having the interaction that we actually want. So we're teaching people to communicate better and get over those like internal hurdles of things like, this is the way I'm supposed to be. Like, I'm a woman, I'm supposed to be this way. Mm. And instead say, no, I'm Jamie. What do I actually want? So do you find um, that this is this becomes about partner intimacy as well as intimacy within the self? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And I think that the skills translate beyond that because most of us live in a culture of like, if someone says no to you, Mm -hmm. you're going to have to convince them to say yes. So when you start looking at it differently, when you start feeling good about saying no, because most of us, we've said no at some point and we did not get a positive response. Maybe even we got a violent response or it came back to bite you later in a social or emotional way. Mm -hmm. So um, teaching people to say no and feel good about saying no will not just affect your intimate, your dating life, the person that maybe you're dating or if you have multiple partners, if you're poly, Mm -hmm. but also friendships, your business relationships, your relationship with community, your relationship with the earth, because you're respecting your own sovereignty. Mm -hmm. Like this is my body. I get to choose who touches it in what way, when and how I get to choose if it's a no, if it's a yes. And that really empowers people because we are just not used to living like that. And not a lot of people talk about it. So when they have the space to be like, oh, I said no, and it was cool. No one freaked out. What else could I be saying no to? What else am I tolerating that I don't have to be tolerating? Yeah, and I think um, I asked that question because um, when, when you're talking about these things, what's running through my mind is um, how are we treating ourselves intimately? Because I was in an intimacy group actually a, a, quite a, quite a few years back, and I remember the first step of that group was to evaluate how we um, take care of ourselves in a romantic way. Yeah, and that kind of blew everyone's mind open because we had never considered: Am I doing this in a way that I want? Even though yeah. it's us with ourselves doing these things. Oh yeah, yeah, because really we internalize these messages of like, I need to give, I need to give, I need to worry about what you want. And we're always like, giving from an empty bucket and never even ask that question. Like, you know, what, what are the things I actually enjoy? I think self-care is a term that we yeah. throw around a lot, but don't always practice of things like, no, do you take a night off for yourself and ask, what are the things I actually want to do tonight? Mm-hmm. Like, uh, I asked this question, how do you feel about yourself when you're by yourself? And I'm like, I love being by myself. I'm going to do exactly what I want. I'm going to chill. I'm going to like, I love like, like a bathtub is like one of my favorite self-care things. It's not for everybody. I've got a sister that hates it. When in doubt bathe is my, uh, yeah, but it's (laughs) go-to phrase. It's my thing. And I, I take care of me so that when I am with other people, I, I'm not, Um, trying to serve them from an empty bucket. And then I can also give service to others I actually want to give Mm. instead of what I think I should be doing because uh, I'm I'm a person. I need to do what I actually want to do. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. And I feel like when you're saying no, um, learning these boundaries, you're actually creating more time and space for you to enjoy yourself and and do the things that you need to do for your own bucket to fill up your own bucket. Yeah, and it can be really sweet when you're with somebody else and they're giving you something you don't want to say, I don't want this thing. That can be such a relief for that person or to say, you know, this is what I actually want. Mm -hmm. Is this something that you'd be into also? And you can start negotiating for that thing that you actually both want because we live in a society of assumption of like, I assume this is what you want because I've made an assumption about how you look or what I've heard you say. So if you can be really specific, you actually get the intimacy in relationships that you want. And you're walking away from interactions feeling good, even if it's something that used to drain you, 
because you set these really careful parameters like the lights are too bright the room is too loud or i don't like this kind of environment and you go oh i don't want to be too much of a burden but it's really sweet like that clarity is kindness yeah i mean people cannot read our minds and so that kind of um, negotiation that you're talking about allows um allows for a landscape of communication that wouldn't be there otherwise or you'd be um interacting in a way that wasn't um true to who each party is yeah in a way yeah absolutely and we're also a space that's very affirming of people's gender identity of their orientation and their relationship style so there's an assumption about how men ought to be how women ought to be and it the our pop culture really like it leaves out people who are non-binary or gender fluid or like yeah i'm a woman but like I don't fit all the femininity stuff. Mm -hmm. So when we can be really specific, then we can actually communicate that to other people. Be like, these are the things I actually like. So in our pleasure talk that we teach, we talk about that first. Like, what is the actual connection we're trying to have? Because the thing is also, not everybody is pursuing like penetration. Not everyone's pursuing full on sex. Like, yeah. um, I love being in a nurturing space with people. I love cuddling. And that's an important part of connection. And our culture tends to say, like, that's not good enough. Like, there's a goal at the end. We're trying to get to the goal. So what if we say there's no more goal? I'm actually going to go for what I want. Mm -hmm. And that's what I want. And some folks are asexual. They are not <laughs> interested in going there. So does that mean they're completely cut off from intimacy? Like, these are the secondary consequences of living in a culture that's very binary and very goal-focused mm -hmm. in relationships. So we talk about what is the connection we're going for? How do we do that safely? And then the last piece is then the pleasure. Like what is pleasurable about this when we come together? Lots of people teach safer sex talks like Dr. I don't know if he's a doctor. Reed Mahalko has one called an elevator pitch. Uh, Dr. Evelyn Molina Docker used to teach the stars talk. She still does, um, which are just different versions of how do we talk about pleasure? How do we actually make a connection that's pleasurable for both of us? Hmm. So definitely, beloved viewers, you know, check these out, these names. Can you say one more time? Um, it was Doc... Reed Mahalko is Reed one Mahalko. of them. Okay. And uh, the other one is Dr. Evelyn Molina Dacker. Check those names She's out. doing a class for us, actually. Oh, fabulous. When yeah. is that class happening? That's happening in May. Um, her whole brand, I, I love what she does. She is a doctor. She's been doing this for many years. Her whole thing is around destigmatizing STIs because... Like I, I mentioned this earlier, we have sex education in school and it usually involves two things. One is don't get pregnant and the other one is don't get an STI or a disease. Mm -hmm. So she is about saying like, okay, realistic, it's, it's just bacteria. It's just a virus. Like uh, many of these things are treatable. We have a lot of medications, even uh, getting an HIV diagnosis is not a death sentence anymore. But because it's so enculturated, like um, if you, like I'm positive for herpes, HSV2. Um, I had extreme shame about that. It has been a journey. And I had to do with the fact that I was scared because that was the only thing I'd ever learned about. And I became an expert and learned like, it's not the end of the world, you're gonna live. And, um, I've met people who have their own nonprofits, but her whole thing is called, uh, what is it? Make time for the talk.com because she's just, she'll just demystify all that crap that you've, you're taught when you're in school because your teachers didn't know and maybe they couldn't even teach about it. Right, right. And, and we're seeing um, an uptick in, you know, um, school board meetings being just, um, just taken over by, you know, parents who are upset that their children are learning the basics of sexuality in a school. Yeah. Um, and I think that it's for safety reasons, but because of these different cultural, you know, backgrounds of different families, because of different religious beliefs, there's this conflict. Yeah. Um, how does your organization work with folks who do identify with some of the more um, sex, not negative, but maybe sex standoffish? kind of perspectives that come with some of these different religions? Hmm. Well, first off, people, they come to us. Oh, okay. So they, they, they want it. We're not, uh, we're not quite like out and about in the public, like getting in people's faces. 
Um, one of the things that we do that really helps people though in our chapters, so I mentioned earlier, we've got chapters all over the place. Mm -hmm. So Sex Positive World, we're our own nonprofit. We present all this, but we are also about starting communities. Excellent. So actually here in Portland, you could find one. We're also in Los Angeles and all over the United States. We just started a chapter in South Florida. Like I mentioned, we're in Belgium. So our events are on a level system and don't don't freak don't out. Forget. Everybody come down. This is not about power. It's, okay. it's not about getting to the highest level. Um, this is about what is your expectation of level of touch? So we have four levels of this. One is like informational, social, like people are leaving their clothes on. You might get a hug. That's it. Level two is when we get into nurturing touch, where we're staying in like a sweet space with people. We do cuddles, like I mentioned earlier, because mm -hmm. It's nice to just have intimate contact and also it's really good for your brain. Uh, you get lots of oxytocin and dopamine endorphin. and serotonin, endorphins. Yeah. Um, it feels really good. We, like, we tell people like you might feel a little drunk after you're here because it feels good just to have skin to skin contact. Like we are, we are wired to want to touch each other. Well, and I know in America at least there are, or in the United States rather, mm -hmm. there are cuddle groups and yes. cuddle meetups. and. Yes. Um, not like platonic cuddling. Exactly. Yeah. That. And we also have events that get into sexier space, which is our level three, which is like, what if the clothes came off and there was touching, but we were not trying to have an orgasm. Mm -hmm. There's no penetration. There's no like need for a safer sex talk. Mm -hmm. Like what if we just played with that energy and also like the give and take within it? Sure. Practicing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then the level four events where we're like, we want you to know how to have a safer sex talk. We want to know that you're capable of asking for what you want and saying no, because those higher risk activities are on the table. But some folks go, but oh, that's not for me. I never want anything to do with that. I just want to cuddle or I just want to go to the massage group. That sounds great. Like I, and then there's a, you know, like witnessing other people as well. Mm -hmm. So it lets us explore this taboo unspoken part of our, body of ourselves of our community also and do you find that um have you been to other areas where there are sex positive orgs have you visited other places in the united states or elsewhere yeah so i'm from california i used to run the chapter that's down in ventura it's called sex positive 805 and there's also the la chapter so i've actually visited many of our sex positive groups um there's a lot of like kink groups also that are into bdsm and there's swinger groups, there's the Bonobo Network, like there's, there's all sorts of like little groups. The thing that makes us different, I think, is the fact that we are built on community. So these folks will throw a party or do a workshop, you know, and they don't really get that connection between. Our founder, Gabriela Cordova, when she started this in 2009, that was her mission. She went to this amazing conference, had all this juiciness with people where they're like body paint and all the things getting intimate and she goes I want this all the time and now we have like a dozen chapters all over the United States because we growing, all wanted it right exactly That's exactly news. yeah well it's uh, it's definitely sounding like this is something that we have needed for a long time because we don't talk about these things um, in schools and now there's pushback against bringing it up at all in schools yeah. and so our youth are being raised um, not knowing some of these things about sexuality and um, parents are feeling uncomfortable. Obviously, yeah. if you've got lots of parents coming to you, you know, wondering how do I approach this? And before we came on, folks, um, we were chatting a little bit about, you know, how are youth growing up differently um, mm -hmm. with regards to access to adult um, entertainment that yeah. as youth, you know, my generation didn't really have. We saw like some magazines or maybe you could find somebody's dad's like video under the couch or something. Mm -hmm. but. There wasn't this onslaught of anything all day, anytime. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, actually, I have a sister who is a therapist and she talks about this, like in middle school, that things just like are happening in the lunch yard. And I have had the opportunity to go talk with young people at therapy support groups, um, especially with queer kids. And I asked them, so when it comes to sex education, what do you got? Because I'm curious, which is what do they got? And it's like, they've either got parents who were really proactive who took them to a bunch of sex ed and they've had like three of them that were queer inclusive and amazing and I have others that are like oh yeah one afternoon someone talked about that and all they heard about was STIs and pregnancy so 
yeah, you have on the one side this hypersexuality that's goal driven, that is a paid promotion that also appeals to the male gaze mm-hmm. and fits into the uh, other patriarchal systems of our culture. And then you have, um, I know everything all at once. <laughs> like, like that's, it's one of the two when it comes to young people. I think it's a really confusing mes- message. Yeah. Um, and so you did mention that um, youth can come if they have adults with them. Um, can you talk about, like, have you seen um, a change happen with the folks that you're building community with in this space, um, either youth or adults, and, and how that looks? Yes, on the personal level. Like, like even for me, like, I'm a survivor of domestic abuse. So for me, this has been extremely healing when it comes to, like, my trauma. Like, to know that I can walk into a space, I can go somewhere that's uncomfortable, know I can walk away, that I can say no, that I have support. So I have seen that in other people as well. I just want to own my story Mm -hmm. of of even things like if you and I share a hug, what kind of hug do you want? And I've seen in our boundaries classes, like people with tears in their eyes because they're like, oh, my God, I don't have hugs in my life or I haven't had somebody be so respectful of my boundaries before. So I see personal growth. And that, like I said, once you start setting those boundaries, it's not just in your intimate relationships, it's also in your work life, in your community, in your friendships. It's like, it has this cascading effect. And then when it comes to families, it has helped, I've seen parents be like, you know, I had this thing going on with my kid, I didn't know how to handle it, and I came to these classes and I had a personal realization about boundaries, and then I could actually have that conversation with my kid. I'm like, oh, this is why I do it. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I've been hearing a lot from different, folks, friends of mine who have youth who are starting to get to the age where they're, you know, going through puberty and what have you. And um, these conversations are so, so important then. But what I've heard from a lot of um, parents that I'm friends with, at least, I know this is anecdotal, but is that um, the more they take care of themselves and learn about intimacy within their own selves, the better they are at helping their children understand that for themselves. Yeah. So So not until they do it. I I have a mantra that goes, we are called to teach that which we need to learn the most ourselves, which is why I teach the boundaries class. So I think that totally translates because it's invited me to be vulnerable. And when I can go in front of a group and say, I have herpes, that opens it up to other people like, oh my God, it's not just me. And that they can see that like, it's not the end of the world. So yeah, the more that you heal yourself, the more you're capable of being there and helping others and moving through hard feelings and like intimacy. There's a lot of hard feelings. It's true. Yeah. It's true. And again, you know, we're not being taught this in our education, in our public schools. And I think that our parents weren't either. And so yeah. it just sounds like you're kind of breaking this cycle of um, misinformation and not having knowledge. Yeah. And that really can give people the tools that they need to, to build the life that they want. Yeah, the safe like, life that they like want. Like GI Joe, you know, knowledge is power. Yeah, like, just to go back to that, but it's it's true. It's really true. Like if you don't have language to describe what kind of relationship you want, if you don't have the language for it, then you're like, I don't know how to describe this, but I kind of want this. I kind of want that. I'm kind of attracted to boys. I'm kind of attracted to girls, and I don't know what that is because the only way I've learned is I should only be attracted to the opposite gender. And then you learn what what means to be bisexual or pansexual, and you're like oh my god that's the word i was looking for i think that a lot of people have been coming to the realization the more we talk about these things the more words that we can have to describe um who we are and i'm really interested in the cultural component too of Mm -hmm. of, um you know unpacking those different intersections for folks because culturally um sexuality is is different all over the world yeah and i'm i'm curious your thoughts on that Yeah, so we have a class called Sexy Intersections because we do talk about this in all of our classes Mm -hmm. because we like the continuity, but this one explicitly focuses on that. And what we encourage people to do is to think about things like uh, the four block walk. Like if you're going to a cool, sexy event, how does it affect, and we explicitly go to the binary of men versus women. Mm -hmm. And with women, it's like, I do this to protect myself. And the the board, the whiteboard fills up with things. We ask our masculine folks and they're kind of like, maybe five things. We go, interesting, since that's different, let's explore some more identities. So we actually find that 
that's when people can actually talk about their culture and the things that are very vulnerable to talk about. Like, um, I was in a room, because we do breakout rooms, where we'll have, like, three people, and we're like, what's an identity that the three of us share? Mm-hmm. One of them was, we use they, them pronouns. We all are somewhat non-binary. And I went, you know, one of the things that I'm asked to talk about all the time is, like, what is the trans experience? Because people think, well, if you're not on the binary, you're trans. And I'm like, but that's not my experience. That's right. actually a separate experience. And all three of us are like, me too. So we actually create experiences that let people tease out those identities. Because I find for me, my marginalized identities are things I try to sweep under the rug and pretend are not happening. But it's let me come to a softer, more vulnerable place where I'm like, oh, it, it, it's not just me going through this. Mm-hmm. Like, we're all going through this. So we make space for people to talk. And on top of it, sometimes we do things that offend people crazy Um, wild so we also teach people like if someone says to you that hurt my feelings and that thing like it was a racist thing it was was a very anti-queer thing to say to instead of getting defensive about it to say i'm sorry (laughs) i'm thankful that you said something and also like thank you for helping me grow we also call it the spinach in your teeth moment where we're like you don't get mad at the person who tells you you have spinach in your teeth you're very grateful that they're not gonna let you be the person with spinach in your teeth and you ask them where is it and more importantly did i get it right i love that analogy and i love that you came in tonight to talk with us about sex positive thank mm-hmm. you so much for being open for being yeah. vulnerable and putting the emotional labor in to describe um everything Absolutely. that you've talked about today that has personal resonance with you Mm-hmm. Um, I want to let folks at home know that this show, Open Playground, it's a studio-run volunteer production that happens every Friday from 4 to 8 p.m. at Open Signal. So if you have talent or information from your nonprofit that you want to share or you want to get involved with studio productions here at Open Signal, please go ahead and contact us at www.opensignalpdx.org or simply call us at 503-288-1515 Tuesday through Friday from 9 to 5 or Saturday from 12 to 8. You can also reach out to our studio facilita- facilities coordinator, Vo, at vo at opensignalpdx.org. We hope to see you all soon here at Open Signal. And thank you again so much. Can you let our viewers know again how to find you? You can find our events at sexpositiveworld.org. All of our events are on a sliding scale. So please check us out. Come check out our classes. It's really worth the time. And once again, what are the names of those classes again? We have Orientation, Awesome Boundaries Around the World, Sexy Intersections, and The Pleasure Talk. And it's been a pleasure talking with you today. Thank you, Thank you so much again. Mm-hmm. This is Cat Meow with Open Signal with our lovely friend Jamie from Sex Positive. We hope to see you soon at Open Signal. Have a good rest of your day, everyone.